Well, good morning, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. I'm Jason Kelly here in New York. I am super excited about this panel because it's about sustainability. It's really about fast cars at the end of the day and the role that a key motorsport is playing in the broader conversation around sustainability, around climate, but also the future of sport. So I'm delighted to have with me Julia Pillay. She is the sustainability director for Formula E. Dilbag Gill, Dilbag Gill, he is the CEO of Mahindra Racing. And Theodore Swedgemark, he is the chief communications and sustainability officer for ABB. Their name, of course, is on this series. And it's such a timely conversation, guys. First of all, happy to have you with me because we were just seeing Formula E right here in New York City over the weekend. A lot of action, to say the least. Julia, I want to start with you. Tell us about Formula E because people have heard of it, I'm sure. Many people in New York probably saw it uh, going on here, but this is a relatively new effort. Uh, tell us what it is, where we are, as we try and understand this in the broader conversation. Sure. Thanks, Jason. And first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be. It's great to be here. So, Formula E is, uh, is uh, I mean, an international car racing championship. The big difference is that we race electric cars, single seaters, and we race in the heart of cities. So, uh, we we've been going around the world, and uh, very very lucky to have just been uh, in New York uh, last last weekend. Um, and, and the point of Formula E, of course, uh, is very much to promote electric vehicle. Uh, there's, I mean, motorsport is a, class, a classic platform to advance uh, technology, and in that case, electric vehicle technology. But quite, uh, I mean, uh, quite innovatively, Formula E was really created to, to push electrification and help uh, the mass adoption of, of electric cars and very much uh, use this uh, car racing championship, which is fun and exciting, as a tool to, to switch perception around electric cars, uh, because I mean, I mean, we're seven years old. So uh, ten years ago, the idea was kind of like conceived. Ten years ago, obviously, uh, we could see that there was kind of like a huge trend towards electrification. But obviously, that kind of like from the consumer point of view, um, I mean, there was not really kind of like the pickup. And also, then from the car options point of view, the type of um, I mean uh, choices in the in the shops. Uh, we were kind of like lacking a bit of kind of like a diversity and options. So uh, that's been what the championship has been, uh, I mean, pushing and doing over the last few seasons. Right. And, and I am fascinated by this intersection of kind of business culture and, and sports. We spend a lot of time thinking about how this advances broader goals. So Theodore, come on in here because I want to understand the the investment literally here that, that you guys are making, putting your name on this series. How did this come about and how does it feather into to the broader goals there at ABB? Well, thanks, Jason. Also, first for for inviting me here to join my uh, my friends, both Julia and Dilbar. Of course, uh, we know each other very well. And for I mean, for ABB, this is uh, really the per perfect platform to to, and it's the first time in FIA history that somebody gets to also attach their name to uh, to an international racing series like that. And the reason is very simple. I mean, the purposes of these two organizations are perfectly aligned. And we really see uh, our engagement in, in Formula E as both an opportunity to really drive and create excitement around electric mobility, which we believe is uh, is really the, the you know the future. But also, in, of course, in terms of profile ourselves as a company, as I mentioned, it's, it's you know it's a directly related to the heart and to the soul of what we do to drive sustainable progress with a, with a clearly purpose driven approach. All right, so Dilbach, at the end of the day, we're talking about really fast cars, and we're also talking about a transition. As Julia mentioned, you know, Mahindra is incredibly well known. You guys are, like ABB, investing literally and figuratively in this. Your chairman, Anand Mahindra, who is well known to many in this audience, was here in New York. So clearly, this is something that is top of mind for him and for the entire company. Help us understand the context uh, for Mahindra as well, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about the race over the weekend. Well, I think for us, uh, essentially, this is going to be the showcase of innovation and technology for the group. We are basically trying to work towards introducing a brand to emerging markets. 
And at the end of the day, also I think what we're trying to do is to see the impact of climate change and pledge to a greater ROCE. When you talk about ROC, what we talk about is return on climate and environment. And Mahindram uh, Racing essentially is the greenest team in motorsport, and we take this credential pretty seriously. Having spoken about that, I was just hoping you didn't ask me about the results from last uh, weekend because we didn't do too well in New York. Uh, we qualified well, but we didn't race too well. I think the, just the temperature of New York got to us, and we sort of uh, started consuming the car slightly more than what we anticipated. But overall, I think the, the event in New York was fantastic. I've seen it grow over the last couple of years. I've been, been in this championship since inception. And I think we've been like coming to New York City and just to see the enthusiasm coming behind the event and what we are able to put down in Brooklyn and looking at Manhattan in the background and trying to see, okay, wow, we are literally at the capital of the world where we are racing and it's something amazing. And so, Juliet, I, I want to dig in, if we can, to, to this sort of cultural economic nexus th that we're seeing, because part of, and you alluded to this earlier in the conversation, this notion that, you know, seven years ago, 10 years ago, you know, this was a, a nice idea. It has, pardon the, the, the figure of speech, it has really accelerated, it feels like, over the last uh, couple of years in terms of the visibility with the consumer of electric vehicles. Help me understand how that figures into the the plan for Formula E and, and what you've seen that's especially taken hold here. Well, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, the objective of the championship is to um, reach out to, to new audiences. Uh, and, and we are very much working, especially focusing on the new generation. And certainly, uh, I mean, the sustainability strategy and then from the strategy all the narrative that goes around it is a very powerful tool because we know especially Gen, Gen Z, sorry, is very, uh, is very attentive and very focused on, uh, I mean, this sustainability angle and the credential that is brought inherently by the championship. Um, again, just to mention, we were the first sport to achieve net zero carbon certification from inception last September 2020. And that's something that resonates massively to kind of like uh, you know the, the B2C audience. So uh, we are very much using these kind of like technological platform, but also all the things that surrounds uh, um, the event to really, uh, I mean, pass on the message. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad to be with uh, with Theo and with uh, Dilba today because uh, the involvement of our teams and partners is absolutely essential. And we really try, I mean, the, the way we kind of like we say it is creating value through values. Uh, from the sustainability angle and commitment of the championship because, um, I mean, we are not only working with experts in their field in terms of sustainability, but they are in turn enriching and bringing something more uh, that enables us to grow the scope of the sustainability credential uh, of what we do on our events um, and kind of like, um, on the many kind of like, uh, uh, aspects of, um, I mean, of, of our championship, really. And so, Theodore, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, the sponsorship element here is really important and, and all of us have worked around sports for, for a long time and understood the, the commercial aspects of it. The ecosystem, the sponsorship ecosystem here, the sponsor ecosystem and the commercial ecosystem is fascinating to me because there's, there's obviously some endemic players, but you're also trying to, to reach out a, a little more broadly. How have you seen that develop? It, you know, as you guys have been involved in this for, for the past few years? Well, I mean, there's been been quite a lot of partners. There's been some shifts in, in the whole thing. Of course, since we came in, I would say the, 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 the overall level of engagement has increased. And for us, we are a big company. We put technology at the heart of what we do. We're smack into kind of electrification and automation. So many of the big OEMs, for example, in Mahindra included, they're also partners and customers of ABB outside of this partnership. Uh, but um, I think we really see the, a positive direction. We see more and more people who want to, to get engaged and jump on the bandwagon, so to say, of this platform, uh, because all what it brings. And it's really, uh, as you said, it's a great collaboration and group of uh, different types of partners who engage, uh, which, which brings a lot of different benefits to, uh, to everyone. All right, so Dilbag, let, let's uh, get to, I'm just full of like bad puns here. Like, let's get to where the rubber meets the road, <laughs> as it were. Like, how, how does this work? Like for someone who's used to car racing, first of all, it's loud. I mean, we've seen, you know, Formula One for, for years and how popular that is. 
what's different uh, about this and 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 how how does it sort of manifest as a different sort of sport well i think at the end of the day it's very similar it's motorsport we see racing we we see quick racing we see very good professional drivers professional teams going against each other and we are here to compete so from that perspective it's similar to anything else but at the same time it's so dissimilar to everything else because we've sort of gone ahead and broken literally every norm there is in sport we've gone towards new new technologies adopted it at a much faster rate than people expected us to adopt it and thereafter we've sort of said you don't need to come to a race we will bring the race to you so we've gone to city centers uh, downtown brooklyn downtown hong kong paris uh, and those cities like when you said okay you open your window and you can literally see a race going down on the streets below you and i think that's something which is uh, totally amazing end of the day i think what we've also done is we've opened up the sport to a much wider demographic because early motorsport was very cliched to a uh, older male who was there and i think right now we've sort of opened it up to the whole family it's just not a uh, thing because we have children coming down there and i think one of the best things which i enjoy in a race weekend including the weekend uh, just recently in in new york was when a parent brings a child because if they know okay there's not loud sound they're not being exposed to those sounds it's it is safe to bring a child in there and then i can see the father talking to the son or the father talking to the daughter and trying to explain a little bit about motorsport because they can have a conversation over the race and i think that's something for me which is just totally phenomenal um and you know we see a lot of these things going on and at the end of the day also with the conversations i had and we had a few college students who came down for the race at new york and in fact there were some neighbors of ours in boston who came down and questions they've been asking and how they get into it it's just amazing because at the end of the day i think they do realize okay this is the next step of mobility and we are accelerating the development for them which they're going to be using so i think yeah it's it's quite nice to have this responsibility of bringing racing and you know um having an enjoyment but at the same time trust me the competition on track is intense and we do feel gutted right. we don't do too well like as we did last weekend yeah no it's it is very intense and anybody who has interacted with or seen any of the drivers and the teams knows that 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 certainly is the case you know, you hit on something that i want i want to go back to to theodore on if we can which is this notion of technology and and this is a good question that's actually coming into the audience uh, right now what types of innovations that are you seeing across formula e that you are sort of pulling back into the the broader kind of mass consumption or mass production level you know for those of us who and and i count myself among those who have bought an electric car in the past few years we're very interested in seeing how this technology develops what are you seeing and how does that work in terms of the broader commercialization I mean, really, it's it's one of the also again. I forgot to mention that actually in in my opening, but of course, the technology development and the fact that this is a test bed for technology is uh, one of the key reasons why also why we're involved. Uh, we are the world, global world leader in EV fast charging uh, mm -hmm. by far, with 400,000 EV fast chargers installed worldwide in more than 85 countries. As of season nine, we will also become the official charging partner of the partnership. so definitely you will see then as that evolves also over time as the race product evolves and you will have charging during the course of the race uh, you will see further advancements in this stage uh, but of course also the, a lot of the vehicle manufacturers already today we know are using this as a test bed to to you know, to test software and type of battery management and all kinds of different power electronics delva we know we've had some some discussions on some topics in the past where you will see things coming in and of course the technology is to a large extent different than a traditional car so you know it's 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 really an opportunity to test everything like software of course the whole drive train but um, but also things like power electronics which be will become in the future really key components of any electric car and so julia help us understand you know as you work across all of these different teams you know i i think about and the, and the partnerships here especially on the racing side i mean these are some of the best known car manufacturers uh in the world and you know in addition to to mahindra you know you have the likes of bmw which sorry uh dubak i won't mention i believe had the had the winning car uh over this last weekend the partnership with uh, andretti and and michael andretti i got to speak with last week uh, ahead of the race i mean these are 
both from a motorsports perspective, but also a manufacturing perspective, some of the best known names. How has that developed over the past few years and, and how do you keep that momentum going? Yeah, so, I mean, certainly we've reached a phase where Formula E is having actually kind of like the business, uh, the biggest, sorry, lineup of uh, car manufacturers in the world. So we have currently nine car manufacturers, global car manufacturers that are racing within the championship, which is unseen in any other kind of like global motorsport series. And that is basically kind of like the best testimony to showcase the interest for electric vehicle and the interest for uh, the push around this technology and the messaging to uh, your potential customers uh, so that they will buy electric vehicles. And if you take also in parallel uh, all the legislation that kind of like country by country are progressively kind of like uh, banning the sale of kind of like uh, non-electric cars, you understand why, uh, I mean, from LA is, is a highly relevant platform for all car manufacturers in the world. And um, I mean, the, we are extremely, extremely lucky, obviously, to have uh, all these kind of like uh, uh, top top manufacturers, and we work really closely with them. Um, we we made sure, for example, that uh, all teams would be certified uh, for an environmental against an environmental management system, which is the one of our international federation, so that each team would really have their own sustainability story to tell and be able to, uh, I mean, support their kind of like, uh, uh, I mean, discussions with sponsors and so because it's it's not only important to make sure that uh, they kind of like they, they work with a minimum which is a high standard in terms of sustainability for us but also it's it's really interesting and I'll call to Dilba to comment on that because Mahindra has been extremely involved since the very beginning on this uh, on this approach, uh, it's it's also very important for them because that's also a source of uh, I mean potential revenue. Right. All right. So you you went exactly where I was going to go to. I want to hear from Dale back on this as well, because, you know, Mahindra is a massive manufacturer uh, across the world. You mentioned Dale back, you know, emerging markets before how when you talk to Anand and others across the, the management group, how do you balance the sort of the current needs with the future needs in terms of EVs and and how does your work fit? fit into that? Well, I think at uh, Mahindra, we have a pretty robust race-to-road program. And our race-to-road program is sort of divided, I would say, to three, uh, three uh, milestones that you're looking at. The first one, which we have already implemented, is having a large EV, what we call the last mile delivery vehicle. So it's like small three-wheelers and small four-wheelers, which we are using in India right now for last mile delivery. And I think that's really important because in India, 85% of the vehicles sold are either two-wheelers or three-wheelers. And that's the first market we are sort of targeting right now is the two-wheeler and the three-wheeler uh, market. And you've seen that for last mile delivery. So we've sort of, for example, tied up with some of the biggest logistics organizations, including Amazon, et cetera, for their delivery of their products using electric vehicles in India. And that's been pretty successful. The second phase which we are undertaking right now is converting a lot of our existing models into electric. So essentially, when you go into a dealership, you can have the same uh, vehicle, an SUV, you can say, I, I want in petrol, I want in diesel, or I want in electric. So you're going to have the three options out there of that. And the last, which we've just sort of embarked on right now, and you would see the results in the next maybe 36 months, is what we call born electric vehicles. So electric vehicles, which are going to be designed ground up as electric. And that's starting within our own premises in England, where the race team is based. So the race to road program is being integrated to be in the same campus. Having said that, we also love, like to have some fun. So what we went and did is we went and launched a sustainable luxury company called Automobili Pininfarina a couple of years ago. In fact, it happened at a Formula E race in 2018 when we launched the company. And within three years, you've gone from, pardon me saying this, from making the slowest electric car in the world to making the world's fastest electric car. And I think that's the rate of technology transfer which happens from Formula E back to road cars. Is that okay? We had what we call the E2O in India, which was a fun, fun and a uh, lovely vehicle for the Indian roads, but it sort of didn't excite you when you were driving. And now we have the Batista, which was in Goodwood last weekend, demonstrating, City, and the first customers are going to be having it end of this year, which is 1,900 horsepower. And then that's something which is amazing and where we sort of contribute is to accelerate development and taking on these products. I'd just like to share a small case out here, uh, Jason. While we talk about uh, three-wheelers and, uh, and tuk-tuks, et cetera, one of the things which we learned in Formula E was how to drive more efficiently. 
Because as you started driving, we all started uh, when we were much younger was what we call a three-pedal car, which were the, the manuals. Okay, you have the, the throttle, brake, and the clutch. The, uh, later in life, we moved on to two-pedal cars. Then it became automatic, just the throttle and the brakes. And now we're literally going on to one pedal. And we have to sort of rethink our minds of driving because it's just the throttle and electric which you're working on. And the moment you can start driving your car a bit more efficiently in electric, which we have learned from our race car drivers on track, as you can see, trying to be like, efficient, is we've seen that, okay, the income earning capacity of the driver, because he can do those extra miles, goes up. And as soon as people start re realizing that, like, for example, the three-wheeler drivers who are delivering goods, that they can go 15 maybe percent more on the battery charge by just driving a bit more efficiently, is uh, it sort of earns the thing. And that's where the race team, that was the first contribution was, taking the learning of driving efficiently back to the to the market. That's such an interesting point. Theodore, I'd love for you to pick up on that because it it seems to me, you know, looking at this from, from the outside in, is that there's a cultural conversation around the acceptability and the availability, but there's also a technology conversation. Where are we in, in that, in, in your estimation? It feels like the technology is, is coming faster and faster and faster, and you guys have given some good examples of that. The acceptability is coming in faster and faster. But help me understand kind of where we are and what happens next from, from your perspective, both from a, a public perception, uh, but also from a, a sort of product quality, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, by the way, Dilba, I'm still looking forward to trying this Batista one day. But uh, you know, that's not the, the mass the mass kind of, of of EV. But I think we're kind of reached, starting to reach some type of an inflection point where you know the excel it's just going to accelerate now. And you see, you know, car manufacturers from all over the world, whether it's in Asia, Europe, or the U.S., new models are coming out. Uh, I think the charging technology. Where we are, you know, part and key player, it's already very developed. So today, our most powerful charger. I mean, in less than eight minutes, you can put 200 kilometers into a car uh, if you if you uh, if you have enough power behind it, so to say, available. So I think we've really reached a point where culturally, people are starting. You know, more and more people have had the chance to try and experience the great feeling what it means to drive an electric car. And myself, I actually couldn't go back to. To driving a normal car anymore. I do it, you know, on and off when you go somewhere, and it feels honestly a bit odd because the power delivery is not as direct, it's not as smooth, it's loud. You have gears making, you know, necessarily not very comfortable movement. So I think that's that's coming fast. And even you know the typical old, very petrol heavy, head funky people, they're still also now they see there are today. I mean, the Batista is one example where you 1,900 horsepower in the car. And you know that's electric horsepower, um, so it will it will go like a, a rocket, literally. So I think really, depending on where you look in the world, I think Asia is, uh, of course, you have many different different countries in Asia, but for example, China, they're pretty well developed. Europe, you see, really taking off. Uh, I was now being in New York, also in connection with the race. We had the, we hosted a, a virtual event where also Jamie was participating. We had the U.S. Energy Secretary Granholm with us. Uh, one of the race drivers, Buemi, et cetera. And you can really feel the excitement also in the U.S. now coming in. And, you know, there's it's a full focus on this topic also from the, from the presidential administration. Um, so I think right. overall we have now all the kind of technological and cultural key components with the wind and the sail for this to hopefully take off uh, fast because it's needed if yeah. we're going to meet our climate goals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does feel like we're we're at a, a critical but but fast moving moment. So, really good question from the audience that I want to bring to you, Julia, which is, in terms of sustain sustainability practices across the sport and and the circuit, are there practices that you guys are using at Formula E that other large sporting events should be thinking about? Because at the end of the day, in addition to the race, you know, you're putting on a, a mass event um, for fans and, and spectators. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, one of the first things that uh, we started on our journey for sustainability, we, we certified our event, uh, sustainable event. There's an international standard called ISO 2012-1. 
that was, uh, I mean, very important, again, to align very much kind of like the, um, I mean, the ethos and the vision and the mission of the championship with the product, making sure that kind of like uh, you would get kind of like as sustainable as, as, as you could be. And uh, I mean, basically, this certification has, has uh, kind of like uh, meant that we would put in place kind of like a very thorough sustainability approach for our event from the classic kind of like waste management, uh, phasing out of single use plastic to, uh, I mean, more kind of like, uh, I mean, um, I mean, cutting edge project, very innovative and kind of like a leadership type of project, such as uh, the net zero carbon, for example, which, uh, I mean, it took us literally six years to measure, reduce all the impact uh, of our events. Uh, and then get to a phase where we would offset and actually achieve kind of like net zero carbon. So, um, I mean, I, I certainly think that there's kind of like a lot in common uh, with kind of like other big sports events. And, and I, I've always seen Formula E as a platform to test and pilot some of these initiatives and then obviously kind of like make them public and really accessible. Formula E uh, actually contributed to draft and to sign United Nations Sports for Climate Action. Uh, so we were kind of like fund, uh, part of the founding partners. And, and obviously we are kind of like in constant discussions and conversation with these key uh, stakeholders in the sports industry, big, big uh, event organizers such as IOC and so on, where we share our best practices. Sometimes we even kind of like try all these uh, practices for other sports, such as the next Paris Olympics uh, 2024. Uh, we are doing some common work on renewable energy uh, power for our event. Uh, because uh, our site in Paris is going to be actually an Olympic site for uh, the mm. Games. And they are using us really as kind of like a sort of guinea pig uh, to, to see if they can actually kind of like scale this up uh, for the Olympics. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is all about collaboration. The, uh, I mean, the only, uh, I mean, the thing that we need to do is, is to really be kind of like working in the same direction because we have uh, 10 years to radically change the way we we work and uh, and we leave. Yeah, it's such an interesting point too. And and Dilbug, I feel I feel like you are uniquely qualified to to take this uh, this exact point uh, a step further because, as I understand it, you previous to this managed the relationship for Mahindra with FIFA, if if I'm not mistaken. So you understand sort of the power of sport, I believe, both in terms of its, you know use as a, a tool for gathering large amounts of people, but also the power of sport, I think, to influence people's behavior. How have you seen that and, and how does that play into what you're doing now? Well, I, I think many times we underestimate our power because I think like sport and technology has a huge influence on people and what we're seeing a, a tremendously through Formula E right now in terms of adoption of what we're trying to do. I think the main thing what we what we try and sort of we've tried to do at Formula E is that to prove electric vehicles are a genuine option because if when you start considering your mobility options that this wasn't and we have to look back okay, we started seven years ago and electric mobility was very very early in its stages of development and where we have reached in the last seven years is something which is amazing in terms of like people like today it's become a genuine alternate like when you and i consider like looking at an automobile option going forward electric is top of mind it's no longer a consideration which is law, law, like a law, lot below like today if okay whichever segment you're looking at depending on your needs there is an electric choice there and then that's just uh, something which is really amazing is that today you want a car for long distance there are options you want luxury electric there are and then that's something which is increase, increasingly uh, uh, like sort of something which we like to do. And what uh, Theo and team are doing at ABB is amazing because one of the big problems was charging. And we have started to reduce some of that fear in terms of range anxiety and charging uh, capacity because I think in the end of the day, if the batteries actually become slightly smaller and you have better charging, it makes it even more efficient because you can have lighter cars because many times we are carrying a heavier battery than what we need. It's for that one day we need to drive 250 miles, we're carrying a battery for the whole year, which has a range of 250 miles, when we typically might just need a battery which is really of 100 miles. But if I get the confidence I can charge that in 10 minutes, then I, I would be buying a smaller, lighter, more practical vehicle, which sort of uh, actually has a much bigger and a much more positive impact on the world. Yeah, it is fascinating to to think about, you know, how these things do uh, translate uh, back and forth. Uh, Theodore, we've only got about 30 seconds left. I'm, I'm going to leave it uh, with you. Uh, you know, how quickly will we get to, and this is based on a question from the audience, 
you know, how quickly are we going to get to a sort of power supply and an infrastructure that can really charge the world as it will? I think it can be relatively quick. I think the key point here, and uh, you know, for the, to make this fully sustainable, we really also need to use renewable energy as the source of power behind the cars. Um, and uh, you know, we look at this as a, again creating excitement among people will help uh, you know push this forward, which will help drive also the investment uh, into the infrastructure which is needed, which uh, you know to a large uh, large extent is also the the energy generation sources, whether it's wind, solar, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen or hydro, etc. So I think the answer is yeah. really again the sport is there to create excitement and um, uh, and that's uh, that's gonna that's key.